This is about data-driven decision support and tools. And I just want to thank you again for your sharing of your personal stories and that heartful session that we just had. Now we're moving into a much like a fast-paced lightning talk session. And so I'll use my timer. Everybody up here has five minutes, including me. So I'm going to start my timer now. And then um, we'll just transition into uh, these other kind of resource collections and libraries, the stories we tell about conservation and understanding those stories, um, data and projections and analyses, and then decision processes. How do we integrate climate information into decision making? And so we're gonna go through all of that in the next 75 minutes. I'm gonna start my timer right now. Okay. Oh, and it's already up. Thanks. Next slide, please. Or wait, where's the thing? Great. <laughs> Got me on camera. <laughs> Unprepared after that last session. Okay. So very briefly, of course, adaptation, the adjustment of systems in response to climate change, but this is the important part down here. Um, it's based on what you value and how much risk you're willing to tolerate. And, and what we just saw and talked about recently were conflicting values and conflicting risks. And I think that's really important to acknowledge as we move forward, understanding our values collectively and um, coming up with shared risk tolerance. Quickly, um, what actions can be taken to enhance the ability of a system to cope with change and meet our shared goals and objectives. And so that's what we're gonna talk about when we talk about these tools. There are different frameworks, many different frameworks that different agencies embrace. To me, they're basically all the same. Some agencies think about resistance to change, so basically trying to maintain unchanged conditions, even though the system's changing. Sometimes we think about resilience to change. So you're accommodating some degree of change and with the idea of returning to a prior reference condition following a disturbance. So trying to go back to something. And then there's this transition. So acknowledging that change is happening intentionally facilitating that change and enabling the ecosystem to respond to changing conditions and new conditions. Um, and I think what we talked about is really localized changes and some of these will apply. You know, these all apply in different systems based on the local ecosystem and the decisions of the group, many groups managing those systems. Another framework is a resist, accept, direct, very similar, I'm not gonna keep my time, use my time for this, but basically, are you shaping the trajectory of change? If you're not, then you're accepting it. You're just accepting that that's happening. If you are, are you managing for what used to be historical conditions or some type of desired future condition? If it's historical, then you're resisting that change and sometimes that's really appropriate. And if it's new, then you're directing that change. We already talked about this. Um, this was mentioned just in our last presentation or, or lightning talk. Um, there are challenges to implementing adaptation, including climate change feeling too big and too complex, um, not feeling like the information is relevant enough, especially on time scales. Um, one size fits all answers are often, usually, almost always insufficient. Um, and we're looking for real world examples and often this is important. People are doing a lot of things on the landscape that they would never call adaptation, but they actually are adaptation. So often we'll, when I ask farmers, what are you doing to adapt to climate change? They'll say nothing. And then they'll say, oh, well, we're planting these cover crops and we're trying these new crops and we shifted to drip, drip irrigation. <laughs> so what people think of as adaptation is different. And so being careful about what we're saying to different groups is important. So very briefly, our agenda for today. Um, we're gonna talk about resource collections and libraries and stories. We have four speakers and then we're gonna have five minutes for questions for those speakers and then we can all stand up and move around um, during those questions. 
And then we're going to have information or presentations related to data informed decision making. Three presentations on that. These are all five minutes. Again, questions and moving around. And then at the end, we're going to talk about decision support processes, how to integrate climate change information into our decision processes. So with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker. Um, and I, I guess, apparently, I, I didn't use all my time. I have 27 seconds left. So let me stop that. I know, I gotta stop it. Stop, cancel. Okay, um, our first speaker is Ariel Liget from the University of Arizona. And he will be speaking about um, CCAST. You've heard about that a bit. And I'll hand it over to Ariel. Thanks, Emily. And thank you for those uh, 27 seconds. I, I might need them. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Ariel. Um, yeah, I'm just going to take a, a moment, take a deep breath, to ground myself a little bit, invite y'all to do that with me if that feels good. I get pretty nervous up here at TBH, so I'm just going just gonna to breathe into that for a second. Okay. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about CCAST. And what CCAST stands for is the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. That sounds like a lot of gobbledygook to me. Um, but really what it means, I think there's a lot in there. We talk about conservation, so what are we doing on the ground to be managing these resources. We talk about collaboration, how are we doing that together. And adaptation, how are we responding to a changing climate and a changing world. And a lot of how CCAST does that is through peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. Um, great. So CCAST emerged in response to a need from resource managers who wanted a fast and effective platform for that peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. People wanted to know what's happening where, who's doing what, is it working, is it not? Um, and the way that CCAST responded to that need is really on this first line. We developed case studies, so we're telling stories um, about how people are doing this what people are doing successfully and not, host webinars and workshops, facilitate communities of practice where we get to talk about these things together, and develop tools to address the needs that we collectively identify. The collective of this work, all the work that CCAST does together, um, really helps improve the outcomes of work on the ground. So this has like real world impacts to be able to make better decisions and to do land stewardship in a, in a better way. Um, it also helps people get unstuck. So we talked a little bit about those big issues that are hard to tackle. And by hearing success stories and these successful strategies, it can help people know how to approach things like climate change adaptation. All of CCAST's work is issue-based instead of geography-based, so we're not uh, focused on any one place, but rather are talking about issues that we share across really broad geographies. And I'll give some examples of that later on. Um, before I go any further, I feel like I should tell you who CCAST is. I don't have a slide for that. But CCAST is this ever-expanding partnership. We keep getting bigger every year. Um, we're really modular in the way that we operate so we can adapt to bring in new partners. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about the communities of practice. And we're mainly supported by the Bureau of Reclamation and the Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as uh, the Trout Learning Network and the Climate Adaptation Science Center. So to talk about case studies, which is one of the main things that we do, um, they support climate adaptation by sharing those lessons learned, being stories that we can use to share amongst ourselves. They make connections between people sharing and listening to those stories and form the foundation for some of the decision support tools that we create. So when we accumulate enough stories and enough strategies about any one topic, we can turn that into a tool that's usable for people across broad geographies. Um, there are a number of topics that we, that we address. You can see some of the pictures here. And I'm going to jump right to the next slide because I feel like I'm running out of time. Um, we share these case studies in a number of ways, but they're all available online in your little QR code uh, directory, um, the yellow pages of the Southwest Adaptation Forum. Uh, you can see our tag-based search and our map-based search. So this is just two ways of looking through this collection of stories that we've amassed at this point. We have almost 170 up there, about a number of different topics, and you can search through them really precisely or just by, by general topic. And something that's important to highlight is that we develop these with students, and student mentorship is a big part of what CCAST does. 
Um, I'm really proud of the work of our students and what we can provide to them in terms of bettering their science communication skills, their writing skills, um, and also just the connections that they have with the people they meet through CCAST. Our communities of practice are another thing that CCAST does to support climate adaptation. Um, and our communities of practice are really just groups of people getting together to learn how to improve what they're doing. Um, and that might sound a little bit vague, but they're centered around these priority issues for now. So climate change and drought adaptation, aquatic restoration, grassland restoration, um, and um, the non-native aquatic species. And we keep adding communities of practice as soon as we have enough case studies and enough interest from people to tackle one issue together and go beyond just that sharing of stories, to have conversations together to identify these key issues and what we can do collectively to address them. Um, the communities of practice that we have now are really driving the development of tools and the prioritization of our case studies. So the people who are part of that community of practice decide what they want to hear about. And I'm way over time. Um, so it's a modular structure. There are a number of groups that you've heard about uh, over the course of this conference that we're supporting. We help them write case studies. We help work with students that they support. Um, and we help develop tools with them. These are some examples of the tools that we've been decided, the, the developing, and this is my last slide. Uh, so the tools are another way that we support climate adaptation, and we do that by bridging the gaps between research and practice um, and addressing the needs of land managers. So two tools that we have here, one is about drought and climate adaptation, and it puts together a lot of those case studies and resources that we've amassed um, as, as an organization and as a community of practice to be used by that community of practice to help improve management and make decisions. We've done a similar thing with connectivity and climate change uh, in association with AFWA, and we have a number of other tools that are in development. Um, and like I said, CCAST is a modular organization. We can do that with other people, with other topics, and we look forward to do that um, yeah, as we keep growing. And that's it. Thank you all for your attention. Yeah, I'm Lauren Kramer, and I'm with the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. I actually have another presentation later in the session where I have a little bit more time, so I'll give you some more background on the Climate Hub then. Um, but a project that I've been working on for a while is an inventory of forest resources. Um, so these are forest management resources in Arizona and New Mexico specifically. And so this is a two-year collaborative project that's between the Southwest Climate Hub as well as the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center and the Southwest um, Climate Adaptation Science Center, or CASC. Um, and so the idea of this project is just to support climate change adaptation, decision making in New Mexico and Arizona for forestry related professions. And so this project has a few different deliverables and those I'll go through a little bit further in my slides, but first is the resource inventory itself um, and then a tool shed development, and then into a literature and project review, and then a science to services workshop for decision makers as this tool kind of develops. And so first of all, is this resource inventory itself? It looks like, oh yes, there it is, okay. <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like right now. Um, I've been spending the last few months just kind of collecting all of these resources. There's so many out there. I feel like I found them all and I've ended my Google search and then I'll talk to someone else and I'll find more. And there's just a lot of these organizations that are doing the same thing on forest management, um, forest adaptation. Um, so really the idea of this inventory is to just get all of these tools, all of these resources in one place and kind of a one-stop shop for forest adaptation in the Southwest. Um, and so this is what it looks like now, pretty raw, um, just a Google Sheet. And all of these um, resources kind of, um, it's, there's tools, there's um, journal articles, um, there's, there's a lot out there. So putting it all into one place. So then eventually, hopefully, what we want this to look like is an online tool shed that's searchable. It's basically, like I said, a one-stop shop for forest management resources in the Southwest. And this can be searchable by topic, 
um, and just easy to find for managers and anyone who wants to find these resources in one spot instead of doing the crazy goose chase that I've been doing. Um, and so an example of this, our team had put together um, a similar tool shed that's online hosted on our website and that's known as Toby or Tools for the Beef Industry. And here's an example of what this looks like. So this is kind of what we're hoping for the forest uh, management resources as well, where it's a really easy to use um, searchable platform where you can divide all these resources by the kind of platform that it's on, whether it's a phone application, um, reference material, something like that, or software, um, and then be able to divide it by topic. And in this case, we would be looking at post fire or watershed health or some things like that. And then aside from the inventory and um, the tool shed, I'm also gonna be writing a literature review. And this is basically to understand climate adaptive trees in the Southwest and looking at kind of the common garden studies that have been done and that are currently happening and if kind of there's some, maybe some data gaps or some future research needs that we need to look at um, specifically in the Southwest and kind of a big one that I've already been finding, I've talked with Lindsay Quam at State Forestry, um, is that basically the, the nursery that's providing seedlings right now is just not doing it. Um, it's not enough, especially after we heard about all of those fires. Um, we can't keep up um, with the reforestation needs with the seedlings and the seed stock we have now. So um, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that there's a uh, New Mexico Reforestation Center in the works, so I'm excited to hear more about where that goes, and it's very in early stages, but excited to see what that happened, what, what goes with that, too. So, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Um, I guess I didn't speak into the microphone last time. Sorry about that. That's Lauren Kramer. Up next, we have Noah Silvercoats, and he's going to be talking about a new water scarcity solutions atlas, water adaptation techniques atlas um, called WATA. So I'll hand it over to Noah. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, so we put a lot of work into the acronym, so no matter what you think of the rest of this, just remember how good the acronym was. <laughs> um, so I started working on this about six months ago. They brought me in, and the mandate was basically Hey, can you create a geospatial tool to document solutions to water scarcity in the Southwest? Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, we wanted it to be really broad, focusing on multiple scales, so whether it's technologies that you might implement on the farm or at the, at the field level, all the way up to irrigation districts and even you know, watershed and river basin scale programs. Um, and basically to create a reference uh, so that uh, people can uh, have a place to find those solutions whether it's irrigation technologies, different crops, water banking, basically casting a really wide net so that we can identify techniques that have possibility for broader implementation. And remembering that you know, just because something is an adaptation to water scarcity doesn't necessarily mean it's a good adaptation. There's also maladaptation. I mean, we heard about the billion dollar plan to build desalination plants in Sonora this morning, right? So we might consider that that's definitely an adaptation to water scarcity question whether that's good or bad. Um, so the tool is under development, um, hoping to release publicly early next year. This is what it looks like right now, uh, focusing on Arizona. Um, I have about 150 cases, um, so inspired partly by CCAS, also the Environmental Justice Atlas, people are familiar with that. Um, so it's ways to reduce water demand, ways to get new supply, uh, market-based solutions that reallocate water, uh, the rare uh, regulation of water use, uh, drought plans, decision port, support tools that might be used on a farm or ranch, um, and a special category for efforts to conserve water for the environment or in-stream flows. Um, so I'll just drill down into one category and then show you what one case looks like. Um, so we have a filter tool. So here we're looking at um, all the subcategories that are in the crop choice and management uh, main category. So that includes shifting from a more water intensive crop to one that uses less water. So uh, effort in the Verde Valley to replace alfalfa with barley, adjusting the planting or harvest time, right? Planting later, you can avoid some of the heat, reduce water consumption. Uh, dryland farming, probably not surprising to people who work in the Southwest that there is dryland farming throughout the region. Uh, you know, largely practiced by in, uh, indigenous communities. This is a site in the Toronto Nation. Uh, alternative crops, we have a long list here. 
Um, I hope there will be something unfamiliar to everyone there. Um, and also highlighting uh, heritage crops, uh, heirlooms, and indigenous varieties uh, like tepary bean or Sonoran white wheat. Intercropping, which is you know, using the same land to produce two crops, so agroforestry practices. Uh, and finally, fouling, right? No crop at all, thinking about uh, voluntary temporary agreements uh, to retire agricultural land. Uh, so just focusing on the alternative crops category, and then I'll highlight one uh, here, which is a one irrigation variety of barley that's developed at the U of A, University of Arizona. Um, so each case has a page like this uh, with a point on the map, additional information. I'm just going to go very quickly and just point out uh, why, this, why this crop is so amazing. So this one irrigation variety of barley, uh, this is a layer of caliche, which is basically natural concrete that you find a lot in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, this is a standard hybrid barley, and this is the one irrigation barley, and you can see that it's actually punching its roots through the, the concrete there. <laughs> right, so each case has uh, additional information that you can use to search and filter. Um, so the, the categories we talked about, types of water use, water users, uh, which organizations and institutions are involved, what scale is it operating at, um, and then a resource library, so this serves as a resource for anyone who wanted to you know, learn about techniques like this, it will be directed to the primary sources. Um, so next steps, hoping to launch this maybe three or four months, early 2023. Um, always open to suggestions and feedback. We'll have a formal way to do that on the site. Uh, develop some content that um, goes more in depth on some of the, um, the thematic uh, case studies that, that we have in there expanding from just Arizona across New Mexico and the rest of the South, Southwest region. Uh, and again, building these conversations on identifying the solutions that are viable and actionable uh, for scaling up across the region. Great, our, our last speaker for this section before we ask questions is Megan Friggins. And Megan is a research scientist with the Forest Service with the Rocky Mountain Research Station. She does not manage forests. She does the research. <laughs> um, and she's going to talk about the After Fire Toolkit. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you. So everybody uh, putting the pressure on by making their time. So we'll try to do the same. So yes, this presentation I'm going to talk about After Fire Toolkit for the Southwest. Uh, like to point out there's been a number of partners in the development of this toolkit and there are uh, this list is growing as this site has been continuing to develop so the after fire toolkit really regards uh, post wildfire flooding and erosion events and so these are some uh, pictures of uh, flash floods and, uh, debris flows contributed by uh, doctors moody and moser um, and this is really kind of the focus of what the various information that's on the site um, regards. And so the initial idea for the toolkit that I'll be talking about uh, came from a series of workshops. And if you're interested in these workshops, there is a really nice report that you can link to or you can search by the title. Um, a number of useful outcomes about what we might do for dealing with post-fire environments, uh, one of which was a desire to see an online toolkit to help resource managers plan for and mitigate post-fire flood impacts. And so in 2016, the USDA Southwest Regional Climate Hub provided some support to be able to uh, generate the toolkit that I'm talking about. So what we're seeing here, if I have a pointer, oh good, I do, uh, is kind of a schematic of the online resource um, in all the various tabs, and I'll use this to navigate or show us where we are in the individual pages as we go through. Um, the website can be uh, uh, navigated to you by this link down here, and hopefully I'm not blocking the view too much. If you click that link, it will take you to this home page, which is you know, After Fire Toolkit for the Southwest, and we have these various tabs. And again, I'll be using this diagram to kind of navigate our way through. As part of this project, we created a report that kind of provides an overview and synthesis, I guess, background on post-fire flood issues um, and on the tools and everything essentially that's provided in this web page. So if you like it all in one place, you can download that report from this website as well. 
um, the website is designed to make it easier to access information that you might be specifically interested in. This uh, homepage also has some other uh, websites that you might want to go to. For instance, if you're having an emergency situation, immediate response, this is probably not the website you should be on. And so there's other links to other types of information. Um, and so with that, we'll just start going through this. Is that me? I'm pressing it. <laughs> if I hadn't got it to work already, I might think it was me. Okay, so uh, this is just our background. This is uh, information, this is, these are drop down question and answer format. The background page is just essentially excerpts from that report that provides terminology, kind of where we're coming from, where things are going, why we care, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, the resources tab has three sub-tabs, uh, the focus, resources focused on managers, community and landowners, and training and examples. The training examples are very much like uh, webinars on background information. The manager resources really focuses on the burned area emergency response teams and their assessments of risk because uh, a lot of that, those fair teams are the majority of what the federal um, agencies do. Community and landowner resources involve a lot of NRCS and what they help communities do. So in our toolbox uh, tab, we have programs and tools, technical papers and guidelines, or other web resources, excuse me. Um, the programs and tools, so that's kind of the, the meat of the site. So that's where you can find all the software. It's kind of divided into software programs and um, alert systems, uh, technical papers, guidelines, as as it kind of sounds like, and then a variety of other web sources like that might be focused on different types of audiences, so like the FireWise website, which is for communities and local. We have a funding tab that, that shows you uh, support divided amongst like state-sponsored programs and federal programs. We have a publication, a small library that continues to grow. Uh, that contains a lot of the articles used for all of the information you see on this website as well as the various tools. We've also geo-referenced each of these articles and so you can go to the journal map link and look at your specific area and find a short list of papers that, you, that deal with this topic. And then finally we have a photo library and so there's a, a number of photos up there if you want to contribute any um, you're welcome to. These are freely available to use for whatever purpose you want, your own presentations and things like that. I also wanted to point out that we uh, did a analysis of the existing uh, resources, I guess programs and tools for estimating risk and, and various aspects in the post uh, fire environment and specifically looked at how a lot of these different software programs, how accessible they were to local land managers in terms of, uh, I think, your expertise and your technological requirements and things like that. And then also it talks about um, what they actually you know, might estimate. And so this doesn't include some of the worksheets and stuff. This is a diagram just showing you the programs. So if you're interested in this or we, we really encourage you to go check it out and tell us if anything is missing. We're trying to make this a comprehensive tool set. We would love to see more pictures and case studies. You can contact Katie or I through these websites. Um, this is the address to this tool and then another address um, this much longer to, to <laughs> over our team description. So. Yeah, you take care.